get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs like the founders of P90X, Atari, and many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Our sponsor today is Rise25.com, which helps service professionals, doctors, lawyers, accountants, coaches, anyone working with clients one-on-one, stop trading time for dollars and shift from a one-to-one client work to one-to-many. You can go to rise25.com, learn more, download the free dream product ladder, which is basically a business plan on one sheet of paper that helps you see gaps in untapped revenue potential. Uh, Companies like Disney, Apple, Sporting Industries all use versions of the product ladder. Check out rise25.com. Today, I am very excited. Uh, Hailing from Germany, we have Franz Jordan. He's the co-founder of Celex, which is a powerful all-in-one tool that combines everything sellers need to be successful on Amazon, right? What what more can they ask for, Franz? Celex evolved from Franz's first company, Marketplace Analytics, which is a German analytics company that was first of its kind to focus on Amazon SEO back in 2014. In the internet years, that's a long time, friends. You can manage and optimize your sponsored product campaigns entirely in Celex PPC Manager. Other features include a profit dashboard, keyword ranking optimizer, competitor monitoring, and much more. Companies like Bosch Appliances, Lego, and Brita are just some of the many companies that use Celex. Franz, thanks for joining me. Thanks for, uh, for having me, Jeremy. I'm, uh, I'm very happy to be in the show. Yeah, and I want to dig into why you started this company a bit because I know, you know, from your background, you're not a seller, right? So right. why did you start Celex? Uh, yeah, you know, I think like so many stories, it, it happened by coincidence in some way. Um, so at the time, uh, you know, that's back in 2013, was, um, you know, my, my current co-founder of Celex, um and I, we were running another company called About Local. Um, and this company was dealing a lot with, you know, scraping data from the web, right? So crawling different sorts of information, uh, then analyzing the information and, you know, making some use out of it. Any particular um, and then, type of data that it was crawling? What was? Yeah, so mostly was crawling um, marketing activities of SMBs, right? So the idea was to generate a database where you could, uh, you know, just see all the the the, the ad spend of SMBs, uh, and then you could, you know, use this information to um, to improve your sales performance. So mm-hmm. if you're if you're selling marketing to SMBs, then you know you could target um, target those SMBs a bit better, right? Yeah. So, so you want a, so people who are maybe agencies or something that want to help these small medium businesses market you see well who's spending the most anyways and we'll go to those people exactly so yeah. the idea was you know it, essentially this idea came up when in the in the groupon hype uh, i don't know if you know remember I the mean, daily I'm from Deer chicago hype. so <laughs> right. groupon started here and early on i remember um emailing back and forth with andrew mason because they wanted really? feedback on what was going on. This was before they blew up. This was really early on in some of the early staff there. So, yeah. Awesome. Well, that, yeah, I mean, uh, so you know the, better, the story better than I do, right? Uh, but so essentially at that time, the, the big story was that all the, you know, those, those uh, millions of SMBs uh, who spent billions in offline marketing, um, they will, you know, transition this offline spending to online, right? Um, and uh, the big problems though, the, the, those all online marketers were facing is to actually, you know, have um, efficient sales. Uh, for those SMBs, right? And so we were offering them a, 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 a way to have a better targeting um, to then, you know, reach out to those customers more effectively, right? Instead that of just calling those, everyone, right? That call. company, Franz, was venture-backed, right? Exactly, exactly. So that was my first company. Essentially, I came right out of uni. Um, and uh, so we, we raised some, some first some angel investing and then also uh, a venture round uh, or an, um, a, a seed round, essentially. And uh, yeah, so we we worked on this um, on this uh, on this company for roughly two years, and then during those two years, um, a friend of mine uh, who was a seller, an Amazon seller at that time, so very early on, you know, he was starting to sell some private label products on Amazon.
Amazon. Um, and so he came up to me and said, like, hey, Franz, uh, I know you're very good at, you know, scraping and, and crawling. Um, could you crawl my, my, my rankings on Amazon? Because I want to know for which keyword I rank uh, so mm-hmm. that I can, you know, improve my rankings. Um, and so... You know, at that time, uh, you know, the, our our company wasn't doing too well, so uh, the, this entire you know SMB market is is actually quite tough. Uh, I always say we developed the same way that the, the group on stock uh, stock uh, uh, <laughs> developed, right? So we went up and we went down, <laughs> and uh, and so you know we said, hey, that's actually a good idea. And so you know, eventually um, we we shut down the the first company, um, and then we started this uh, this new company, which was first called Marketplace Analytics in Germany. And then as we entered the U.S. market, we uh, rebranded it to, to Celix. Yeah. So I want to dig into, you know, Marketplace Analytics, which is now Celix. But um, I also want to learn and have the audience learn from what happened at the first company. Um, what do you think was the reason why it didn't go as you as you planned? What were some of the, the challenges and some of the, the reasons for that? Yeah. So, the, yeah, what? Um, there are like a, a few learnings. So the, the first learning I took away is that the, the market, the, the fundamental market environment is the, the most important thing um, for, for any startup, right? Um, so, and by this, you know, I don't want to blame the market and say we did everything right and it's just a, a market thing. Um, but I think that the, the market decision is the key thing. And so um, the, what we had essentially is, you know, we, we started in a hype market um, where, you know, there were a lot of companies. And so we also had a lot of customers. Uh, but when eventually it became clear that this model doesn't work for a lot of companies, a lot of our customers just had to start, shut down. And then, uh, you know, from essentially within a, a few months um, or like, let's say, six or nine months, uh, a big part of our market kind of evaporated um, and, and wasn't there anymore. So the, the market wasn't there. Really. Why did it evaporate? Uh, well, I think because this SMB marketing model is just extremely, extremely difficult in a sense of the the uh, the revenue you can make is very tiny with a, like a, a small customer. You can make a couple of hundred euros, um, but uh, the acquisition cost is extremely high. So I always say that you have the revenue potential of an A uh, of a C customer, but you have the acquisition cost of an A customer. You know where you right. need to essentially drive up to him and 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 do this. So I think that you know it's it's very difficult to have a profitable business. Um, in the you know marketing space for for SMBs, uh, and I think it will change over time because you know um, at that time that's like five six years ago, uh, you needed to do a lot of education. So those SMBs they didn't really know what to do online, and I think you know once they know, have a better understanding of what's going on mm-hmm. online, it would be cheaper to acquire them as customers. Uh, but at that time it was just very hard to do it profitable. So everyone was raising money because everyone thought that local you know local marketing mm-hmm. online is going to be the next big big market. Everyone had a ton of money and then everyone <laughs> kind of disappeared and so did we eventually, right? What's your skill set? Are you very technical? It sounds like you were no, doing no. some technical things. Uh, with the yeah, so we Absolutely, my my co-founder is uh, so he's uh, you know the the tech wizard. I'm a, I'm the business uh, I'm a business guy, right? Got it. Uh, so I have a business business background. And so the uh, the other thing that I wanted to mention is since you were asking for the learning, so one yeah. the market super important, and then the other learning uh, to me was that um, I always summarize this as hope is not a strategy, uh, because you know we we saw things going wrong in the market right mm. and for some reason we didn't we always continued being like yeah but maybe this will happen maybe that will happen and so yeah. on and so we kind of you know I, I think we lost like six six months at least maybe even nine months where we kind of felt that it wasn't really working but we still continued without logical reason just kind of kind of hope right and so hope is not a strategy it was is one of the key things that i you know i tried to be very clear uh in, in this venture you know what made you decide to shut it down? Because I could see you're at it for two years and, and some people while pushing, you know, continue to push through. At what point did you realize, okay, we, this is, we just got to, we got to shift. Because that's not an easy um, decision too. You have, probably have investors that you have to go back to and tell them this yeah. and yourself and, yeah. You know. I, it's a uh, so in general this this entire process is very painful yeah. um because you is you know it's not like, you like wake Jeremy up one thanks day. for bringing it up so I can relive this painful <laughs> painful <laughs> <laughs> no but really I mean you know it's, it's 
And because it's a process, it's not like you wake up one day and you're like, oh, today I need to shut down the company. I mean, you, you see it coming, right? For months and months, you see it coming. Yeah. Um, and so eventually, really, the trigger when we decided, okay, let's shut it down was that uh, with our investors, we had a milestone where they uh, were supposed to pay out a new, um, a new tranche of, um, of funding, actually the last one. Um, and just based on the targets, you know, we actually, we could have gotten the, the, the last uh, payment. But, uh, you know, we told them, hey, listen, guys, either you give us the money now and then we will run out of money in four or five months and we won't get any new money. Or we just, you know, let's let's be honest, this is not going to work and we mm. just uh, we just shut it down. Yeah. So it was a um, it was a very painful, uh, painful period. But, um, you know, the, the most painful part is essentially telling the team. Right. Um and then, uh, yeah, because, you know, those people, they, they trust you, they, you know, they spend a certain time of their career with you. And then, um, yeah, telling the team is the worst. But yeah. once once you're through this, you kind of feel relief. You're like, oh, finally. A weight's you know. lifted off you. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so you then start Marketplace Analytics, right? And yes. so what, you know, your friend was asking how they can rank higher, like any Amazon seller wants to rank higher, they, you know, want to make more money. Um, so what did the first version look like of, I guess, in Germany, Marketplace Analytics, now Celex? Yeah. So the the very first version, if you want to call it, is uh, essentially an Excel spreadsheet uh, where with, you know, we were kind of, it was like a mock-up of the future interface that we would build. And so this is, uh, you know, this ties into this hope is not a strategy. So this time with like the second company, you know, we wanted to be sure to provide something of value before we really invest into this. So what we did this time is really, you know, we were essentially selling Excel interfaces or Excel spreadsheets. You're proving um, it out. Yeah, we were really making sure that there is value there, you know, because we're kind of, you know, given the bad experience, we really want to make sure that their value is there. So uh, we really thought about what's the absolute, you know, minimum product that we could build. And essentially, it's an Excel. Um, so, you know, my co-founder was crawling the data. I was processing it in Excel. And then we were setting those, you know, kind of one-off reports to customers. Um, the advantage here being is that each report can be adjusted very easily. So every feedback can be incorporated in the next version already. Um, so we did this for you know a few months, like four or five months. Uh, we saw that it's actually going very well. And were they uh, at paying? Some point, were they paying beta customers, or were, was it yes. free? Yes, they were. No, a second learning from yeah. uh, company number one. You know, never, never for free. Um, it's yeah. uh, you know, if it's worth something, if you know, they value it, pay. they'll pay for it. Exactly. Uh, you know, if if you give something for free, what happens is you know you call them every week and be like, hey, have you tried it? And be like, oh no, sorry, I didn't have the time to try it. But call next week, and this can go on for months actually. <laughs> so, uh, how don't, do you don't decide what to charge at the time? Um. So, you know the. Well, um, the, the first customer essentially was actually a very big uh, brand in Germany. I don't know if you know uh, Teufel. Teufel, they make like sound, uh, sound systems. Uh, they're mm -hmm. like um, Sonos, uh, in the kind mm -hmm. of German version of Sonos. Yeah. And so we were sending out those cold emails. Um, and then Teufel was replying, saying, hey, this sounds interesting. Mm. Um, how much is it? And right, so we said Teufel. Oh, my God, it's a huge company. So at the time, we were asking for an for what seemed for us absurd amount of money, right? So we said, okay, listen, there's a, a cheap version for 1,500 euros and then there's the expensive version for I think like three or 3,500, right? And so we just put the expensive version to kind of, you know, anchor them so that they would buy the, the, the cheap one, which for us was a lot of money. And so they sent back and say, all right, guys, so we take the expensive one. Mm. <laughs> and, so what did you like, have to uh, deliver on the expensive one? <laughs> Yeah, so we didn't know because we didn't have the product at that time, right? So we needed to come up with like, uh, you know, a, a report that's actually worth like three and a half K. But so when we saw that, you know, people are willing to pay three and a half K for it, um, you know, we kind of downsized this expensive report to a version uh, that is scalable um, and that is still uh, quite, quite expensive. So it's eventually we tested a bit, but so most would pay something like six, seven hundred euros for the report. So what did the those first reports give people? What information? So <laughs> they gave them um, es essentially very actionable insights. Um, so, you know, we, we had this analysis in Excel um, and then we were running those, um, uh, you know, those, those formulas where we were giving very precise uh, hints on what to do. So we were telling, hey, for this product, you need to add this keyword into the title and this mm. keyword needs to be added to the back end and so on. So we were giving them very precise. How did you know to uh, do that? To do. Is this from your scraping background or? 
Uh, yeah, essentially, I mean, uh, you know, uh, we tested some things on Amazon, which we, we kind of re-engineered the Amazon algorithm um, by, you know, doing experiments. And this way we learned, you know, how the Amazon algorithm works. And then based on this, we just, you know, um, doing some Excel work, uh, we kind of, you know, uh, took the keywords and it's Excel processing, essentially. Yeah. Mm. So this is from, yeah. So they we get a report at this point. Mm -hmm. And so that first report, they paid whatever, three, 3,500 euros. And you yeah. give them this report. What happened next? So were first, they happy? Didn't call were they not happy? What what happened? <laughs> so it, it, eventually, eventually they were very happy, right? Eventually. Uh, but to be honest, <laughs> I was scared for four weeks to call them, right? Uh, so I didn't call them in four weeks um, because I was just too scared to get the feedback, right? And then eventually, because they, they so I don't know, so I sent the invoice, but they didn't pay. So I, I was calling them to ask essentially for the pay, right? Mm -hmm. And I was, you know, I was expecting this huge, you know, this huge punch to my face of what kind of piece of shit we are delivering. <laughs> but essentially, that they, they, they were very happy. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, that was an important proof for us because we really put in a lot of effort. So it's it's the Excel report plus I think it was like. Uh, Oh man, it was like a 30 page PDF documentation on how to use the report and how the Amazon mm. algorithm works and so on, right? And so at that time we learned that, you know, three and a half K is not much for such a big company. That was one learning. But the other learning was that, hey, the, it, it's actually valuable what we're providing to them and, and they were happy. And, and they turned uh, to our first, you know, recurring customer um, mm. later on when we had the interface, right? So how does that, what you did at that point, show up now in the Celex product? Where does that show up? Is it like the rate? Because I know you have different things. You know, as, as anyone goes to the site, there's a profit dashboard, PPC manager, ranking optimization, product research, inventory control, competitor monitoring, review manager. Where does that original product show up? Is that more in the ranking optimization or? Yeah. Or, yeah, it's in the ranking optimization. To totally, ranking optimization. So, you know, the. I mean, the, you know, when, when this friend came up to me and said, like, hey, why don't you crawl Amazon? Um, you know, our first reaction was like, uh, come on, dude, just do some research and find this tool that offers this because there are so many tools for Google SEO. There must be some tool for Amazon SEO. Yeah. Um, and so he told me, man, I've been looking for weeks now. There is no tool that does Amazon SEO, right? And um, so we looked into this market. We, you know, we became curious. We looked into this market and we, we saw that, you know, Amazon is growing like crazy. And we also saw that there's a shift in consumer behavior. So up until this point, you know, most people, when they were searching for products, they went to Google. And what happened at, you know, around 20, 2020, 10, 2011, um, more people started to actually search products on Amazon than on Google, right? Um, and so, you know, it just made sense to us that, you know, if people search for products on Amazon, then you need to optimize your rankings on Amazon. And we just couldn't understand why nobody is, is is talking about this topic, you know? You, you entered Amazon SEO on Google DE, so the German Google, right? You literally got three results, like three results wow. talking about Amazon SEO, you know? You know? And so the, the main question for us was like, why is nobody doing it, you know? And uh, so, you know, the... the it's a I good and a bad thing, right? Because you almost want to <laughs> see some competition because it validates that there's a market there. And when you don't, yeah. it's good if you're the first, but then it's scary that well do we want to be the is there no market here right because what you previously experienced was it didn't work so it's you probably got paranoid you, you you're totally right uh, i can tell you you read people very quickly <laughs> but uh, yeah i mean that was insane. so you know i always say that you know if, the, if you're the only one doing it you know you're either very smart or very stupid um and so uh, you know for us the key question are we smart are we stupid doing this right uh and uh so you know we we Given the previous experience, you know, we were very, very, um, you know, we didn't want to lie to ourselves. You're very we, we methodical. Smart, but yes, exactly. Very methodical. That's a good word. Yeah. So this one you bootstrap. And uh, yeah. And uh, so this is, uh, yeah. This one you bootstrap. Sorry, go ahead. It wasn't, you didn't take this on one investing. Is bootstrap, yes. You just validated yes. the market, took, you know, pre-sold it before you created it to make sure there was value and then um, actually produced what the market wanted. From you. Absolutely. Yeah. And this is uh, also, you know, a direct learning from company number one. Uh, you know, if uh, if you have the money, if you have a million in on, on your bank account, you know, you can go on, uh, even though if it doesn't make sense. Um, whereas if you bootstrap, you cannot go on if it doesn't make sense, right? So was the first product that you had in Celex ranking optimization? Was that the first product that you offered? Yes. Like when so you very... so you took the Excel and then what happened next? How did you actually produce? You actually 
obviously you're not back there when some a customer signs up producing a report anymore. What does it yeah. look like now? So now it's a, you know it's an entirely web-based uh, interface. Uh, so you know you just go to the website, you sign up for a 14-day free trial, you can try it, and then um, and then you know you just log in and use it online. Uh, in fact, we just released an app also, so you can use it on your mobile phone. Um, at least some parts of the of the tool. Uh, so now it's an entirely you know software as a service kind of model, uh, recurring uh, recurring um, um, uh, you know monthly kind of fee that you pay for using it. Um, it is entirely integrated with your Amazon account. So when you set up the Celix account, essentially you just connect to your Amazon account. We pull all the data directly from Amazon. So I mean, I mean, you know, I mean, we've been working on this for three years. I think it'd be pretty sad if we were still doing Excel files. Right? <laughs> what um, what's working to improve people's rankings? Right now, um, increase purchase likelihood of your product. Um, mm. So that's essentially you know the 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 way Amazon ranks products is by purchase likelihood. Right? Yeah. So Amazon will rank the product on number one for the specific keyword if this is the product that's going to be bought with the highest uh, likelihood. And so now the question for you as a seller is what can you do to increase the purchase likelihood, right? Um, and now then you have a bunch of factors. Of um, a keyword I'd, though too, right? I mean the keywords, yes. Yeah, because I've heard things and I don't know what what's allowed or what's not, but you know. Uh, or what your opinion is, and I'm going to say a term which I don't fully know what it means, but um, yeah. when you have, uh, what do you call the super URL? Yes. <laughs> what are your thoughts on that? So basically, I, I'm, I'm curious what, I mean, from your explanation, what is a super URL? My understanding is it's basically you have searched for this keyword on Amazon, and then you take the URL that, that has your, that keyword in it that goes directly to your product. Yes. Is that I mean, so accurate or? The, the, so, you know, the. Feel free to correct the, me. Yeah. Uh, I mean, so the, the way that Amazon is measuring a purchase likelihood is by actually looking at how many people, when you enter a keyboard and Amazon shows your product, how many people are clicking on this product. And then once they've clicked on this product, how many of those then bought the product, right? So they look at, look at click through rate and conversion rate. Um, so if you have a very high click-through rate and a very high conversion rate for, for a keyword, you will rank very high for this keyword. Mm -hmm. And so the super URL is one way to kind of trick the Amazon algorithm that some user search for a keyword and then bought your product after searching a keyword, even though it didn't happen. Is that uh, more so like I, a black hat method? Like, is that allowed or is it not allowed? It, no, no, it's a totally black hat method. Got and it. Uh, so it's uh, it's also, I mean, it's questionable whether it's still working today. Um, so there are some sort of advanced super URLs where, you know, apparently it's still working, um, but it's, it's totally black hat, yeah. Got it, okay. <laughs> we'll talk white hat for a second, so. <laughs> Yeah, so the, the the white hat version would first, you know, to be to to make sure that you have all your keywords in place, right? So that you have researched all the keywords and the keywords are in the correct, um, you know, spot within your product. So you know, most important keywords in your title, second most in your bullet points and your backend and so on, right? Um, so the keyword part is certainly one part, and then it's everything you can do to optimize your conversion rate. You know, uh, have the right uh, content, have the right copy, have the right reviews, the right images, the right price. You know, align all of this. So you know, making sure that your product is presented in the best way possible, and that you give the relevant information that a user needs to make a, a purchase decision. Yeah, right? and so I mean, Those are the basics. one of the biggest things, Franz, with that is it kind of all goes back to identifying the keyword, right? Yes. So what are some ways people can actually, because that has to do with the click-through rate and conversion, because really you're wanting a specific keyword that people are already searching. You don't want to pick some random keyword and, and optimize for it that no one's searching because then that doesn't <laughs> help the, the sell-through. So how does someone identify, what are the best methods to identify what keywords they should actually be focusing in on? Yeah, so the best method would be to use Celix. Because exactly, we have a great I knew you were going to say that. Feature. I totally <laughs> threw that up. <laughs> that, was, <laughs> that was too easy, Jeremy. <laughs> but uh, no, which... but uh, so, you know, I mean, so there, there, let's say there are a bunch of tools that offer keyword research for Amazon, yeah. just as there are tools for, for Google. Yeah. Um, the kind of the, the easiest way. Um, so is that the, and product, also, the product research piece of Celix? Is that where that, or would that be more the ranking optimization piece? It's still part of the ranking it optimizations. Is. So okay. the, the ranking optimization, let's call it module within Celix, consists of various sub features, you know, that, you know, let you research keywords, that you place them correctly, uh, help you to write your copy and all yeah. this kind of stuff, yeah. right? So that's all part of SEO. Yeah. Um, so but let's so assume, the, let's um, assume, okay, like 
obviously Celex is a tool that and I've talked to several advanced sellers and whenever this topic comes up, they do recommend and use Celex. But from right. a, someone who's like, well, you know, I want to see how else to do this. What are some other methods? Like one, I think is, you know, some simple ones, some, let's say from the Excel spreadsheet days ones, um, you know, if you start to type something into Amazon, right, and it auto populates a bunch of like if it was, I don't know, baby toys and you start typing baby and then you see all the other things. So that's one way to see what actual keywords. Exactly. What are some other ways that, you know, manually people can configure this stuff out? Um, so the, the best way, honestly, is the one that you just mentioned, uh, mm -hmm. which is the autocomplete of the of the search bar, because, uh, you know, the, the, the things that are showing up that are popping up in the autocomplete, you know, those are not just random keywords. Those are the most searched keywords right. based on the things that on the on the on the on things that you entered. Right. Yeah. Um, so this way, at least you can make sure that already you are targeting the, those high volume keywords. Right. Um, another very easy way, essentially, is just, you know, you enter your most um, your most relevant keyword. Right. Um, and then you just look at, you know, let's say the five, ten products ranking there. Mm. And usually, you know, it's, see it's what they're doing just, a little bit. You, you know, just look at the titles because typically those products that are ranking high, they have very well optimized listings, which means that they have researched the most important keywords and put them into the title. Yeah. Uh, so just by looking at the title, you know, just, you know, you hover over the keyword uh, search result page. And uh, you just look at the titles and, you know, you take some keyword here, some keyword there, and then, you know, you'll come up with a lot of ideas. Yeah, that's a great suggestion, Franz. You know, I've, I've looked at that a little bit with some companies and some are just completely horrible. Their listings are absolutely horrible and they're in the top, you know, whatever couple. And then some are, like you said, amazing. You know, just you tell they know yeah. what they're doing. They, they have it down. So maybe they just have been on for so long. The ones that are just absolutely terrible have been on for so long that they just <laughs> have such a high sell through or something like that. Yeah, you know, it could also be that it's just a brand, you know, um, if it's a very well known brand. Um, so let's say, uh, you know, we talked about Brita water filter. So it's it's very popular in, in, in Europe, I don't know, in the US, but you know, popular. usually, yeah. If, if people type in water filter, uh, usually they're, they're searching for a Brita water filter. Yeah. So they could have a very shitty listing as long as it's the real Brita water filter. Um, they would still sell very yeah, well right. because that's what people want, right? Yeah. They don't want to have some fake ripoff. Uh, they want to have like the original Brita water filter. Yeah. So, you know. It, so yeah, ranking optimization, decent. Franz, was number the first piece yes. of sales. What was next? Um, next was review management. Right? Really? Okay. Uh, because I would not have guessed that actually. Yeah, it's uh, you know in, in hindsight, uh, you know I would have done a few things differently, but so at this, this time, you know we were just listening, we were following on customers, right? So people were telling on, hey, this this keyword and SEO part is great, but you know I'm. I, I want to know when I'm getting new reviews and I, I have no way to do this except for looking up the listings manually. Yeah. And if I have 20 listings, I need to check 20 listings on a daily basis. How painful is that? Could you just do a tool? And we said, for sure, you know, and so we just implemented review mm -hmm. management. And um, this is essentially how Celex evolved ever since. It's just, you know, listening to our customers. Uh, now, obviously, we do this in a lot more, again, methodical, uh, methodical way that we do it, um, yeah. that we did it at the time, right? Uh, so we track all the requests and everything now. But uh, at the time, it was really just, mm. you know, I've been on the phone all the time talking to customers and they mm. told me what, what, what they want to have, right? And so we What just do you it. use to track everything at this point? What uh, software uh, do you use? How how we uh, yeah. so we use a uh, Podio. I don't know if you know Podio. Mm -hmm. It's like an Asana. It's like Asana in Europe. Yeah, or it's something? like Asana. Yeah, okay. it's from Denmark. It got acquired by Citrix uh, a few years ago. Oh. So, but it's uh, yeah. So we use it for this. Essentially, you know, we just have a long list of feature requests, and whenever yeah. there's a new feature request, we just count it. Essentially, like one more, one more, one more. So, kind of at stuff, what right? point do you decide? Because I'm sure you get tons of feature requests. At yes. what point yes. do you decide to actually uh, integrate into the product? Um, well, first, it's always a question of capacity, right? Yeah. Um, and um, then it's. Uh, it's not just the customer feedback, uh, to be honest, um, because we also made the learnings that customers are pretty good at telling you what the pain is, but not necessarily are telling you what the solution is. And sometimes it's also kind of a misperceived pain. Uh, so we have some requests where we know this is not working, but for some reason people still ask for it. Mm. Um, and so then those kind of features we wouldn't build. Uh, so it's really, you know. What's like I mean, the latest we, feature that you released 
that because you were taking what their pain was, but creating a solution for them? Um, so the latest feature, um, yeah, the latest feature essentially was the, was the app that we released, right? Mm. Um, so we have one feature that uh, users love is the profit dashboard because essentially you can track literally your profit, not your sales, but your profits live throughout the day, right? Um, and so, you know, people were, were logging in multiple times a day uh, to just track the, you know, their current profit, essentially. Um, and so we, uh, you know, um, we just saw that the user Why for you, this feature... You shouldn't inside. be feeding into their, their um, uh, lack of productivity, right? <laughs> <laughs> now I'm going to give you well, an app so you can look, look at it 10 times a day. <laughs> Well, I, I, you know, I wouldn't say it's enhancing a lack of procrastination. I would okay. say it's enhancing motivation, you know, oh, because okay, you see okay. how you're doing. Right? <laughs> I was saying productivity, like it's they're wasting time. Doing, anyways, yeah so, yeah, so you created <laughs> right. an app. Yeah, so we created the app, you know, and uh, again, the, the 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 way it is today is very simple. It does one thing, it just shows you the current profit for the day, you know, and and, and also, you know, the previous days, but it's, it's not fancy. It does the basic thing, right? And again, people... The, you know, when we release it, we are, you know, not scared, but we were still like, oh, maybe this is not enough in terms of features. But then the feedback was, hey, guys, That's this is exactly wanted. it. That's all they I, wanted. I, I don't use, I deleted the Amazon app from my home screen now and I replaced it with uh, with uh, Celix mm. because that's the information that I need, right? And so those are great, you know, great moments for us because it just shows that, you know, spot on, you find like the one thing. And um so we try to become better at this, you know, in the, in the past we had this approach of, you know, this kind of how should I, kind of like the pump gun approach, you know, you shoot many bullets and see what sticks. Um, and so now we come, um, and I think this is a result because at the beginning it was very, um, you know, it was very, we were seduced by all those feature requests that were coming in. Yeah. And, and so we were just building it and, you know, no matter, and we didn't really have too much of an own opinion towards those, um, those feature requests. And now, you know, since we've been in this market for quite some time, we do have a very good understanding of our customers, of how the market develops and all this kind of stuff. You know, we have a, a stronger own opinion of where we're going, right? So we combine our opinion with the customer opinion. So you have ranking optimization first, review manager second. What was next? Yes. Uh, next, I think it was a profit dashboard. Uh, profit dashboard. And, uh, yeah, I think the profit part was uh, was next. Um, then we had the competitor part that came next also. No, actually, that's not true. It's not true what I'm saying. So we had the competitor part and then the product research part. What does the competitor part, the part do? Um, essentially, it shows you how many units a competitor product is selling. Um, mm. which obviously is very interesting uh, to many So how sales, do right? people use that to improve their click-through and conversion? Uh, they don't use it for that purpose. Um, they use it for two other use cases. So the first use case is you want to uh, see how good you do, right? So if you sell 10 units a day, is this good or is it bad? Well, it depends on how much all the others are selling, right? Mm. Um, so that's the first use case. And the second use case, and this is why it's tied to the product research, um, they want to see, for instance, you have a competitor, he's selling like 10 different products and you want to know which of those products is doing very well uh, so that you might you know, take into your selection as well. Uh, so, you know, you would uh, just monitor those 10 competitors' products and then um, choose which yeah. products you source. Actually. I see. So it's, it's what uh, markets or products you want to expand into exactly. also. I was just thinking from a standpoint of the, that almost integrates a little bit with the ranking optimization because if you look at your competitor who's selling more than you and you see what they're, and you look at their titles and their keywords or whatever they're using, then you can use that on the ranking optimization side. So they kind of all go together a bit. And it's, it's funny you mentioned it's exactly what we do in the SEO part. So we benchmark your own product, your own listing with mm. the top ranked competitor products, right? Um, but so we, you know, I mean, it's probably a question of definition, but so we consider this as, you know, the SEO part. And Got so the, the competitor part is a um, kind of is more of the expanding into different yeah, products. Kinda. I gotcha. So it's not a very clear definition, but, but yeah. So what was next? Then the profit dashboard was next? Profit dashboard was next. Okay. You so hit, why um, why did you produce that? They just wanted in one place to see what they were doing. Like it, you framed it, it's funny because you framed it as motivation, and I framed it as lack of productivity for the app piece. <laughs> but um, what are you seeing that people? Why did they? What was the pain point? Why they wanted the profit dashboard? So the the pain point is that if you wanted to know your profit before Celix, it probably took you a couple of hours to do it. 
Um, and so if you want to do this on a daily or weekly basis, this is a couple of hours that you need to invest to know how well you're doing. And the reason is that the Amazon backend that Amazon is providing is so limited in terms of functionality that it's really, it's a thing of you need to do 10 different exports or 20 different Excel export and you have those 10 Excel files. You need to combine them. You need to do some, uh, you know, some some filtering, some sorting, some reports, some uh, right. some tables and all this kind of stuff. It's just a huge, 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 huge mess, right? And so now, you know, we integrate with the API, we pull the data automatically, we process the data automatically, and we just display it right away. And yeah. obviously, you know, this saves a ton of time and, you know, profit is a very important metric for, I, I think, any business, but particularly in the retail business, you know, where it's always a question of margin, yeah. um, it's, it's even more important, right? So the two last ones are inventory control and PPC manager, Yes. which was, which was after the dashboard. The inventory control, inventory. right? Yeah, because I mean, this is also, you know, in hindsight, it, it, it's so obvious, but at the time, you know, we just didn't think of it. But then people were like, hey, uh, you know, um, you tell me when I get a negative review. Um, and if I get a negative review, my drop, my, my sales might drop by, you know, 5% or 10%. But if I run out of stock, my drop, my sales drop by 100%. Yeah. Um, and especially beginners, you know, they're so exciting about having their first product live. Then they forget that on average it might take like I don't know three months to you know the entire process from ordering a product to finally have it available on Amazon it takes like yeah. three months or so. So they just forget it. So they you know they're very excited and they they run out of stock and they're like oh damn now I need to reorder and then you have this gap of like three four months where you don't make any money at all right. Um, and so you know we felt that inventory control is something that is it's not sexy you know you don't like to talk about it. But if you don't do it, then you know your business um, can uh, it can just disappear very quickly. So, so does you know, it give you inventory. like uh, does it send you automatic messages or something uh, when you should reorder or what does the inventory control do? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so essentially, what it does is um, it calculates based on the current sales velocity, calculates when you will run out of stock, hmm. um, and then uh, you can upload the days it will take the replenishment time, right? And so based on this, we can tell you pretty, pretty exactly like, hey, listen, uh, you should order within the next uh, 30 days or otherwise you will run out of stock. Yeah. And then last but not least, and I thought that was going to be an early on tool, not the last tool, yeah. because PPC yeah. Manager is, is hot, right? So It is. So why is that the last feature? It's just, is it new? Um, yeah, for, for one, the, this entire, you know, ad space on Amazon is just fairly recent. Um, so, you know, when we started in 2013, 2014, this entire ad space was still in beta at Amazon itself, right? Uh, so it's, it's a, let's say, fairly new kind of um, thing on Amazon. Um, and then uh, the, the other reason is that, you know, the, 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 there were some technical barriers. So there were no APIs to effectively handle those ads, right? So the, the APIs live you know, came out, I think, beginning of this year. Um, so it's really just this year where, the, you mm. know, the topic became kind of hot, right? Mm. Um, and so now, obviously, it's a, it's a super important feature. Um, you know, people people just love how to, you know, um, that, I mean, we, we've reached a point where essentially you can automate your bidding um, through Celix, right? So you can just set up some rules and then we will take care of managing your campaigns, uh, which, you know, saves a ton of time, leads to better results. It's just, you know, it's essentially it's a no-brainer. Yeah. Um, but, um, yeah, it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't possible from a technical point of view up until now. And uh, it's... Um, it, it wasn't too relevant, you know, 2016 or even 2015, even less, right? So what are some of the best practices for setting up the campaign structure? Because I'm sure there's right ways to do it and there's not right ways to do it or optimizing. <laughs> so well, the, I guess the, start with this, friends. What are some of the biggest mistakes you see people making in setting up their campaign structure? Specifically in the campaign structure or in the PPC part? PPC part. Yeah, the PPC. Yeah. PPC in general. Yeah. So, um, so for the campaign structure, I think the and, and again, it might sound stupid, but one of the biggest mistakes I see is when people don't have a clear idea of how to name the campaigns. Um, and this sounds very like, you know, you might think I'm a, I'm a bit stupid, but it's actually it's really, really important that you have a clear way how to name your campaigns, because if you have a few products, you will probably end up with like tens or hundreds of different campaigns. And if you name your campaign something like, you know, December 2017 or test one, two, three, you won't understand what's going on there. You don't want to understand the strategy. And then there's no way how you can find your way, how you can navigate yeah. through your campaign. So this yeah. is a very simple tip, but it, it 
you, yeah. it's, it's just you know, you need to do it. If you don't well, do it, you're, you're screwed. You need to be able to track it and find it first, right? So how do you recommend people naming the campaign? Like do you have a certain ca- structure like keyword and, yes. or whatever it is? Yeah, exactly. So I, I usually recommend the following. I recommend to, to add the product, right? Um, so whatever it is you're selling, you add barbecue glove, for instance. Mm-hmm. Um, then you add the campaign time whether it's an auto campaign or a manual campaign. Um, and then uh, you add uh, the match type, uh, which could be broad, phrase, or exact, uh, so that you, you kind of know the setting of your campaign. You know which product, you know uh, the campaign settings, and then you know you know the most important stuff. Um, and then if you can, but then it gets a bit long, you can um, you, ca- you may want to add the strategy. So is this a, is this a campaign that, you know, that aims for profit? Do you aim for, uh, you know, for units, or do you want to maximize impressions, or you know, whatever your goal might be? So this is how I, I recommend hmm. to, to structure campaigns. So product Perhaps plus you're... campaign type plus match type plus strategy. Is that right? Yes, correct. Yeah. So do you talk about this on your site ever? Um, I, Have you talked I, so about do... this naming before? Uh, I, I don't think it's such an explicit way. Um, okay. We do have webinars that we do on a regular basis, right? Where we, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very sure I mentioned it during the webinar, okay. uh, but I don't know if we have a blog post or so. Okay. So we, you know, we have a ton of webinars and blog well, posts. Well, because it's I, I really know. an interesting way. It's like an equation of how someone should be doing their, you know, their PPC in general, right? I mean, obviously the product goes without saying, but yeah. Um, a contain type, you know, because there's choices in the match type and there's choices in what you do with the strategy, right? So let's um, let's follow that through for a second. Let, can you give an example of, let's go from the naming piece and then, mm-hmm. because, you know, some people for the match type may be only doing, let's say, broad and they're not doing any uh, of, you know, the phrase or exact. I know... I've watched your stuff before and you don't recommend phrase at all, right? Because it's yeah. sort of pointless. You recommend going with exact if you're going to go with phrase, right? Why go with yeah. phrase if there's exact, right? So yeah. um, uh, there's broad and, and exact, right? So can we go through an example of, because I think this talks about your methodology, what you think is best how to do yeah. any PPC, which is the naming. So I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, cause I'm sure most people aren't, they're probably saying December 17th, you know, barbecue gloves or something and they're not putting yeah. so they can see it at a glance. So what is an example we could talk about, um, with a product and then we can talk about the campaign type match type and the strategy and choose one. Is there a good use case so, or I mean- case example that, that comes to mind that, we could talk about either someone set it up horribly wrong or someone, you know, set it up um, and how they optimized it. Um, I, I think the campaign structure is less dependent on the product. I think the campaign structure is, you know, can, can be the same for for most products. I think the only exception is if you have a product with a lot of variations so typically you know mm. uh, apparel for instance you know we have different sizes and different colors i think those products are apart but other than that i think that each the, the structure works for for each product in a, in a very similar way um so the the structure that we recommend um is that you know you have one auto campaign and you have a manual campaign and within the manual campaign you have one ad group for your broad keywords and one ad group for your exact keywords right uh, so that's the structure that we mm. recommend and um, what, you know, I think what's important to mention is that um, this is not necessarily the best structure in the world, but it's a structure that you know reduces the time that you need to manage your campaigns to a very minimum and still leads to very good results. Yeah, so it's, it's like very much focused around this of, 80-20. Yeah, exactly. it's like an 80-20 of a PPC campaign. I mean, who doesn't exactly. want the, the 80-20, right? If, <laughs> if you want to go well, even know, deeper, you can, but most – I mean – if you're not already doing the 20 percent that's going to produce 80 percent results then we should start there anyways right exactly exactly yeah. um you know some some people might want to go even more detail but you know if you if you're a seller and you have so many different things to do during their day you don't you don't have the time if you are employed specifically and you have eight eight hours a day to manage sponsored products on amazon then well you know feel free to go crazy but if you're just a regular seller, then, you know, it's probably better to yeah. go for 80-20. So, the, so that's the yeah. structure we, we recommend, right? So and product, so now what happens? Go ahead. Go ahead. 
No, so you add the same product into into the auto campaign, and you add the same like the exact same product into both uh, manual ad groups, right? And so now each kind of ad group has a different purpose. Um, basically, the purpose of the auto ca- uh, campaign or the auto ad group and of the broad ad group is to find keywords that are working very well with, with your ads, mm. and then the the purpose of the exact ad group is to actually then you know. Uh, do go into Zero the fine tuning and and next for yes exactly. So right. do you recommend uh, so you, people? Okay, let's say you know with product campaign, you know talking about that structure is you have the product. Let's say you do an auto. Um, well, auto you can't you don't control the broader exact, do you? No, you don't. Okay, so you just can, so, for the auto you can go in and find out what keywords are actually working to put exactly. into a broad or exact. Exactly. So you move the ones that are working, you move them from auto into broad, and then uh, you move them from broad into exact. So those are the ones that are working, and you are filtering out those that are not working in uh, in auto and in broad, right? And so this, I think, is super important. Um, that uh, you know, uh, or, you know, if you, if you ask for another, you know, quick or low hanging fruit, the low hanging fruit is to cut the bleeding. Um, you know, it's uh, there are so many keywords that are taking a few dollars here, a few dollars there. You know, each keyword per se is not very expensive, but you have, if you have a huge account and you have you know maybe thousands of keywords, um, then those keywords could cost you thousands of dollars if you don't handle them properly, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so my my number one recommendation is you know in the audit campaign, make sure to you know regularly. Uh, stop those that are uh, that are not working, and same goes for the broad uh, broad ad group. So, when does the negative come into play, and how should someone do that? Oh, that's uh, that, that, it's complicated to do it just you know verbally. Usually, I have a. I know. I try and give you a challenge. <laughs> You know, and it's not even my my mother tongue. You know, this is uh, this is really challenging. I've seen your uh, but, part. Uh, I've seen your slides. It's really interesting. You know, because it's almost like a web of it's almost like a decision making document, sort of, sort of like what you're saying now, exactly. which is if you have an auto, then after you do the auto, you take the ones that are working and you put them into manual, and the manual you can do a separate broad and exact campaign, right? Yes. So just overall, so, I mean, just the, for a second, yeah, explain yeah. negative. I think, I don't know, for me, people explain it in different ways. So what is, how, how does the negative work and, and what is it in general? Um, so let's say, um, so negative essentially means that uh, if you put a keyword to negative, mm-hmm. you don't want any of your ads to appear for this particular keyword, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so um, let's say that, you know, you have, uh, a keyword is a dog house, right? Uh, so dog and house, right? So you could set dog house as you know those two terms to negative exact, which would mean you would not rank for the exact word dog house, right? But you could wor- ra- still appear for some sort of combination, right? So if yeah. you if you put it to negative exact, you exactly you know this is the exact term that you are kind of um, you yeah. know avoiding to rank for. Then you have another uh, one which is negative broad, and there essentially um, you know if you put uh, dog to negative, you won't rank for dog house because dog house contains a dog, right? Mm. Uh, so broad essentially blocks you for more keywords. So, so from do all people keywords even that, use? Do people use broad for negative keywords? That seems like you're eliminating a lot of stuff. Yes, um, it, it, in some situations it might make sense to use broad, right? Mm. Uh, so if, for instance, um, you have a um, like, let's say, for so instance, say, like if you like you mentioned the dog house example, let's yeah. say you have a dog poop bag or something. Right. Yeah. And you don't want your poop bag to come up when someone searches dog <laughs> house because they're not looking yeah. for a poop bag or something. So you may put exact like dog house for that or something yes. like that. But what? I'm trying to think of an example of what, why someone wouldn't do a bro- or why they would do a broad negative keyword so le- le- let's assume you're selling a round dog house right um oh wait no, no, that's that's that uh no le- let's let's go different so let's assume you're selling an iphone case um that is made out of uh, how is it called synthetic leather right um then you don't want to rank for any combination that includes the the term like real leather for instance right mm. um because Oh, well, leather is also not, how. What's um, like or a plastic? Let's say you're selling something. a plastic. Yeah, let's say. Oh, let's say you're selling a wooden iPhone case, right? 
Um, so you don't want to rank for any keyword that includes letter iPhone, right? So instead of what you could do is now you could block all the terms that include leather, right? iPhone case, leather, leather, iPhone case, blue iPhone case, leather, and so on. Or you just put leather into negative broad, which will then eliminate that you rank for any leather uh, iPhone cases, right? Got it. So this is an example where you do with broad, right? Just yeah. make it simple, easier to... Yeah, and, and I guess people, if they see there's a keyword that they're getting just destroyed on, they're making no money but a lot of click-throughs, then they should probably put it into some kind of negative situation, I assume? Yes, well, you, so I mean, if you see that you're not selling, you have essentially like uh, uh, three options, right? First is you reduce your bid, right? To see that maybe if uh, at a lower bid, you still can generate sales that uh, are profitable. Uh, the next step would be to pause it. Um, that means you're not ranking for it. Um, and then the, the last step would be to put it to negative. But putting it to negative, you know, really does make sense um, if you if you want to kind of block the entire kind of category, right? Mm -hmm. So the entire keyword. Yeah. Right? Um, and so, yeah. And so the, um, yeah, so the, you know, what, what, what we suggest how to use the search apps is essentially it's a, it's a bit complicated, but we essentially we suggest to, to put, because uh, um, eventually you have a situation where you have the same keyword in your broad ad group and your exact ad group, right? And so what would happen is that basically you would bid on the same keyword in both ad groups. Mm. And so, you, you know, in order to avoid this, we recommend to, you know, add a keyword to, to the broad ad group as broad and add it at the same time as negative exact in the broad campaign, right? So that you would only bid exactly on this term in the exact ad group. And in the broad ad group, you bid on all the other search terms that belong to this keyword, but are not exactly the one that you are bidding for, right? This is crazy. Yeah, sense. it's, yeah, <laughs> it's, if anyone does not get this, just uh, stick to the earlier conversation. <laughs> but no, it's, <laughs> I, I get what you're saying. You really have to be in the campaign showing someone. It's, it's hard to, if, if you don't, can't visualize it like you can kind of visualize where everything is you almost need to follow along while you're doing it type of thing um yeah. but um and so the product campaign type you know auto manual the match type broad exact or even negative keyword and then the strategy yeah. talk a little about the strategies you know because you mentioned a few like there's profit there's impressions why would you want to do one over the other or what, what are those different strategies people will take with the uh, the so you know, to, to to keep it simple, essentially there are two strategies. So one strategy is to use sponsor products to generate more profit. Yeah. Um, so essentially, use it as an additional kind of sales channel. The other one is to increase your your units, so the the the, the units you sell, right? Um, hoping hmm. to increase your organic ranking by doing this, right? Hmm. Um, so if you want to increase your units, you don't care too much about the profit. Uh, in fact, most people are, you know, are aiming for a break-even kind of situations where they don't lose and don't make money. Some people are even accepting a loss just to, you know, boost their. They'll sales. push maybe the um, organic ranking or something. Exactly. So yeah. that's kind of the, you know, that's kind of the 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 strategy that most follow nowadays. Um, to be honest, I'm a bit skeptical that the impact is still as big as it is uh, so there, there it used to be very big this connection between organic and paid i think they kind of reduce it a little bit and so the the situation that i fear is that you know especially in the u.s because the u.s market is a bit more ahead you know compared to europe um is that sellers spend money like crazy on sponsored products and they always justify it with yes but it's going to pay off increase the sell gonna, through. yeah exactly and it maybe um, rank and them so, high in organic you know, the, and they'll sell more on the back like it, so that's like more the, of a long-term kind of play exactly so exactly. what do you think about um, that you think and, that's you know, this not is, as smart well i think that you know everyone is basing their strategy on the assumption that there is a connection between paid and organic right. and, and nobody has ever tested it and so um you know, I think what's going on in the U.S. market is the cl the click price. The you know the CPCs are going through the roof. Uh, people pay multiple dollars for one click, um, and I think that you know people take huge losses uh, and accept huge losses because they believe it's going to push yeah. their organic ranking. And yeah. if it turns out that this is not true, then you know a lot of people would have a very um, a very you know loss making just, strategy without yeah. ever making a profit out of it. Right? Yeah, there's just a hole in the boat. There's water just leaking out. But a that's a big point. assumption, I guess, right? Yeah, we're we're currently testing it. Uh, we're currently trying to figure out if there if there's some if there's a relation. Or not, so yeah. Yes. Any um, any word because, of it right now? I I, I can't tell. It would be uh -huh. it would be unreasonable for me to tell yeah, anything right now. Um, Franz, this has been fascinating. 
I really appreciate your time. I could probably talk to you for another few hours, but um, I know you have a bunch of, you know, uh, features to to get at. Um, <laughs> and I think yeah. I saw. So everyone should check out Celix.com. If you haven't realized from this conversation, the guy knows what he's talking about, and, and they have some really cool tools. And I know some personally. I know some really big sellers that highly recommend Celix. So everyone should check out Celix S E L L I C S dot com. Check it out. I'm, I think I don't know why you do this. A little bit crazy, maybe. But uh, you have a 14 day free trial. So and there's no credit card yes, required do. on that. No, um, I think this is a European uh, kind of thing, right? I know in the US uh, it's a, it's a bit different, but uh, you know we just we, we feel very confident about the product. You know we don't feel like um, you know we need to trap people into you know uh, converting them automatically to paid customers. So you know I think we we have a very fair offering. Uh, it's good value for for money, and uh, so you know we want to encourage as many people as possible to try it. And then uh, you know if they if they like it, they can just become a customer. Now you guys run uh, something called Sonar Dash tool too is that that's yours right yes absolutely so yeah. talk about that so sonar um so it's, it's sonar-tool.com right and uh, so sonar is uh, a keyword re a keyword research tool uh, mm. so what we what we talked about before um and so what's special about sonar is that it's uh, completely free um even though it's very powerful um yeah. so you know the alternative would be to pay like 30 50 bucks per month just to use a, a tool like sonar um and so we you know we released sonar pretty much pretty yeah. exactly a year ago out talk of, about uh, the of decision of that why why free because you could have obviously easily incorporated into the suite yes. of tools, but you didn't. Um, it, <laughs> um, so what, what was the situation? So the situation was that, yeah, a year ago, essentially, we came up with a plan to, to have this keyword uh, research feature. And so we just wanted to put it out on the market to kind of, you know, the, the key idea was to, to make Sona popular and by this, you know, increase the awareness for Celix. Um, and it, it worked very well for us. Um, and to be honest, uh, I think we've reached a point where we could just incorporate it and it would just be fine as well. Um, but, uh, you know, we don't like to take away value for, from, from the users, you know. Yeah. Uh, even also when, you know, when we add new features, we always, you know, it's always free for the current users. Mm. You know, we never make um, current users pay more for features that we add, you know, because, I don't know, it's just maybe it's... I don't know, but so there's a Chrome a, extension though. You can put it in the Chrome. Yes. And oh then, yeah. Right. 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 So there's a Chrome extension, and the Chrome extension is paid. Um, so there was oh, it is one paid. way. Yes. So the, okay. the, the Chrome extension is is paid. Um, there was kind of you know uh, when we realized we had a lot of traffic on Sonar, you know, we didn't want to make a Sonar uh, Sonar paid version, so we just said, yeah. hey, maybe we can offer a little extra. Uh, so it's just ten bucks a month. It's, yeah. It's not. It's I not mean, really meaningful, but in my mind, you, I want it. If it's a really valuable tool, I want it to be sustainable for the business, right? And it's not yes. sustainable for the business unless you guys are charging. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I mean, uh, maybe people it, want people is, something for free, but I also want. You know, you got to pay developers, you got to pay upkeep. And so I like actually, I'd rather pay for something because I know yeah. it's going to be maintained, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, uh, you know, if, if Sonar was a standalone product, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be a successful company and we would have to shut it down. Right. Uh, but since it's kind of part of the of the Celix family in some way, you know, it is providing enough value by essentially, you know, bringing more attention to Celix. Uh, so we're kind of, you know, cross-funding it with the revenues we make yeah. in Celix. But you're right, on a standalone basis, Sonar is actually pretty expensive because there's a ton of updating and crawling that needs to happen. Uh, so if you just look at the numbers, you probably would shut it down. But overall, you know, we feel it's a, it's a good thing for the for the yeah. Amazon community. What's, you know, this see, your, your products, again, like I did a lot of research at a time, highly recommended. They seem very, <laughs> uh, very good and people highly recommend them. What's the pushback you get and why people don't use it? Um, so I think, um, the, the drawback of having a very powerful solution is always that it's a bit complex to understand. Mm. And, uh, so, um, the pushback we get, uh, is that, you know, people, people, they, you know, they're a bit overwhelmed, um, at mm. the beginning. So they log in and, you know, what you, do I do? the first screen you see is a, is a cockpit, right? That just, you know, it pulls you all the data from your seller central account and shows you data in ways yeah. that, you know, you've never seen them before. Um, but it, you know, for someone who's not used to seeing some charts and some data, he might be like, "Oh, uh, that's uh, that's uh, that's a bit right." So um, I think uh, where where we need to improve as a as a company is to you know help um, you know more handholding as people go through the process of you know 
you know, they, they, they just started selling on, on, on Amazon. So, you know, the entire Amazon world is new to them. Now they have another tool and everything, you know, just you know, do some more handholding and, and really make sure that people understand how to use, how to use Celix, how to be yeah. successful on Amazon. You know, it's, it's not so limited to Celix, just help sellers be successful on Amazon. That's essentially our, yeah. our mission. Yeah. Franz, I really appreciate your time. Everyone should <laughs> check out Celix.com and uh, I want to be the first one to thank you. Thank you very much, Jerry, for having me again, and then uh, talk to you next time. Bye bye. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand.